Well, good morning, everyone. I can't tell you how excited I am to be here. My name is Ted Sabre, and this is my wife, Joanne. And um, since we discovered this devotion, oh, our hearts have been set on fire, and we can't figure out why this devotion is not better known throughout the world. Um, just like the Sacred Heart devotion, just like the Rosary, um, just like many other devotions, the enemies of God have seemed to crush and hold back these devotions, allowing them to come to fruition at the time when they're, they're required. And I believe this is the time that this devotion is required. Um, and we'll get into that. So this is a very special day. This is the 175th anniversary of a miracle in Rome. And I'm going to leave it at that because I want you to just think about that and we'll, we'll, we'll develop the story as it goes along. <laughs> so what is the Holy Face devotion? Uh, we intend on answering all of these questions and more. So the basis, the heart of this devotion is offering the Holy Face of Jesus to God, the Eternal Father, in reparation for our sins against the first three commandments, which wound his sacred heart. And so the, we all know the first three commandments. And as Father Lawrence Carney, who's an expert on the Holy Face devotion, put it, if we don't get the first three commandments proper, how do we expect any, all of our prayers to be answered for the other seven? We're fighting the battle wrong. We need to make reparation for the first three commandments first, and then the Lord will help us answer all the other, the other problems in our, in our society. So why should we practice this devotion? It makes reparation for the sins of blasphemy. Reparation for profanation of Sunday and the holy days of obligation. It fights against communism and all the enemies of God. And um, as Father Lawrence aptly put it in his, in his homily, it's a plea to God to restore mankind to his image and likeness. And this is important key because the Catechism of the Catholic Church tells us that we are born and in the image and likeness of God, but because of sin, we fall short of the likeness of God. And so Jesus Christ came for, to, to restore that, us in that image and likeness through the church and through the sacraments of the church. We become more like Christ. He restores us in his image and likeness. So the other, the other thing is, is we, when we practice this devotion, we imitate the saints by contemplating the passion, and we enter into a personal relationship with Christ through FaceTime. Everybody knows about FaceTime. <laughs> so um, when and where? Well, where did this begin? We could say it began at the beginning of time because every human being has the desire to see God and to know God. Whether we're atheists or whether whatever point we are in our life, we desire to seek the face of God. And, the, and, the, and it's evident in our Bible that it tells us throughout all the Psalms to seek the face of God. So when and where did this actually begin? When did the devotion begin? Well, we could say that it started in the stable of Bethlehem with Mary and Joseph. They were the first ones to lay the eyes on the adorable face of Jesus incarnate and to experience what every Israelite wanted to see, the face of God in the flesh. And then the shepherds and the magi, of course, came next, right? And we, we celebrate this, this epiphany today where the, the, magi, the magi came to visit our Lord and bring in gold, uh, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Next, we have Simeon and prophetess Anna in presentation in the temple. And out of all the people in the temple that day, they were the only two to see Jesus Christ as who he was, right? They, you know, blessed are they who are pure in heart, for they shall see God. They were the only ones that recognized their Savior. Next, we have the apostles and the disciples of Jesus. And Jesus showed them briefly his divine countenance on the in the transfiguration of the mountain, right? He revealed himself for a brief second of his divine presence. But before that, Imagine walking along the Sea of Galilee, and here's Jesus walking along, and he says, come, follow me. And they jumped out of their boats and followed him, right? Who, any one of you going to follow a stranger just because he says, come, follow me? I don't think so, right? So he must have, 
he must have shown them something about his divinity to, in order to allow them to have that experience to say, oh, I'm going to follow you wherever you go, right? So next, we have St. Veronica and the Sixth Station. And this is where the whole story of the Veil of Veronica starts to unveil. We can't say enough about the heroic virtue of Veronica. Imagine this woman bursting through the crowd, a malicious, violent crowd, who was, you know, harassing, and, and the soldiers, these are, these are war-torn soldiers, that she had to break through this crowd. And imagine her taking off her veil and placing it to the face of Jesus. And in a moment of comfort for him, he impresses his face on this cloth for all eternity. Just let that sink in for a second, you know. In his gratitude for her wiping his face from the blood, the sweat, the cruelty that he was experiencing that day, one single woman in her brave, heroic virtue wiped his face. The Arch Confraternity was founded on October 1st, 1885. We have the Miracle of 1849, Revelations of Sister Marie de St. Pierre, the Doctors of the Church, and St. Therese of Lisieux. St. Therese of Lisieux is St. Therese of the Child Jesus in the Holy Face. How many of you knew that? Not many, I'm guessing. And, and this, was, this was really hidden to us until about a year and a half ago when we just went, uh-huh, what? <laughs> so we're going to get to that a lot later. The Arch Confraternity was founded on October 1st, 1885, formally approved by Pope Leo XIII, not just for France, but for the whole world in perpetuity. That means forever. October 1st, remember that date, because that is, a, that is a special date for a lot of people who have a devotion to St. Therese of Lisieux, isn't it? We have a picture of the oratory of the Holy Face in the Arch Confraternity. So it's a picture of a man's house where he did business. He was a lawyer, and he did business in his, in his, in his office, uh, and people would come in to visit him. And this, um, this office became an oratory. Now, why? Why was this? Well, we'll get into that. We'll explain why it became an oratory. But there was thousands of miracles that took place there. They've moved, since moved the oratory to another place uh, in France. So we're getting to the good part. Remember I said at the beginning, this is the 175th anniversary of the miracle of Rome. So what happened? Well, uh, the Pope was in exile in Gaeta, Italy. And there was a huge uprising, and he was in fear of his life. So he went into exile. So he called upon the church, churches to um, display the sacred relics to be exposed. The relic of the Veil of Veronica. And uh, the, the, the Spear of Longinus, and a true relic of the cross. On this day, this was the last day of the veneration of these articles. So around noon... They had the veil of Veronica um, out for, exp for veneration. Now you can imagine, it's already over a thousand years old. <laughs> so it's really faded. It's very, very brown. Um, and so they have it covered with another veil on the top. So beginning at around noon, the veil began to glow, a light glow. And on the image of the external, external veil, an image came forth of of the face of our Lord. And everybody saw it. Everybody that was in the church saw it. So the canons of the church rang the bells, and of course that attracted the whole public, and they asked for engravers to sketch what they saw, to capture what they saw. See, that's what the veil of Veronica looks like today, if you were to see it. It's very brown, it's very discolored, you can't even make out an image. So it was from that Imagine another veil in front of it and a light coming forth in which the face comes forward. So what the engravers captured was the image was an image similar to what you see in front of us. What they did with the engravers when they made up these sketches, they took these sketches and they imprinted them on linens. They then took the linens 
and they touched each one of the linens to the true relic, the true veil, and they touched it to the spear of Longinus and the, the veil of Veronica. That's what the, what the engravers saw, something similar to this. Now, there were several engravers, so each captured a different, slightly different image of what they saw. And so there are some images with the eyes slightly open, but basically the overall image is pretty much the same. And you can see that they had the tears and um, blood and where the crown was on his head, the, the, where the thorns were. So what happened next was those linens that were touched to the veil and to the other things were sent around the world, especially around France. They were sent to the convents first and two of those images ended up in the hands of Venerable Leo de Pont, a holy man of Tours. Venerable Leo de Pont, was, he was an extremely holy man. He was a lawyer and he was a primary beneficiary to the Carmel of Tours. He looked after the poor. He wanted to be a priest from a very young age, but because of an accident, which he experienced in his teens, he caught his thumb in a gate and his thumb was left deformed. So he wouldn't be able to hold the Eucharist. So he was denied application for the holy priesthood. But the Lord had a special plan for him, something that he could do that priests couldn't do, which was something unique in his own way. So he was very close to Sister Marie de Saint Pierre from the Carmel of Tours. And he embraced fully her writings and especially her prayers that she, the rep, that she received through the revelations of our Lord Jesus. So he took one of the veils and he hung it up in his office and he lit a lamp beside the veil. And he told people that would come in to visit him that after you're done business, you leave or you talk about God. And on one occasion, a woman came in and she was complaining with a sore eye. And so he told her, go over to the image, say a prayer, and dip your finger in the oil and apply it to your eyes. And she did, and she was instantly healed. Now this word about what, what has happened, obviously traveled throughout tours. So day upon day, he had hundreds, hundreds of visitors coming in and praying the prayers, and in particular, he loved the litany of the holy face. That was seemed to be his favorite for the healings. And so they would say the litany, apply the oil, and people would be healed. Over 6,000 documented miracles of the veil of Veronica in front of that veil. That's more than all the miracles in Lourdes. He was, he was um, so miraculous that uh, Pope Pius IX claimed him to be the greatest miracle worker in modern times. So next, ah, the revelations of Sister Marie St. Pierre. From the years 1843 to 1848, our Lord revealed his blueprint of reparation to Sister Marie. She was a very humble nun coming from Breton, France, uh, very pious, um, she seemed to enjoy a lot of um, revelations from our Lord from a very young age with mystical experiences. But one of the quotes our Lord said to her is, Rejoice, my daughter, because the hour approaches when the most beautiful work under the sun will be born. And this was closer, a little bit more to the ends of her revelations. But he also revealed to her, I seek Veronica's to wipe and honor my face, which has very few adorers. And he made her to understand that all who do the work, devoting themselves to the work of reparation, would thereby perform the office of the pious Veronica. It was then he, well, he also told her the greatest grace he could have given after the sacraments for which he had been, had prepared and cultivated the soil of her soul by interior trials, which I had suffered a short time previously. I also learned that he deputed St. Louis, King of France, protector of this holy work of reparation, because of his zeal for the glory of the name of God, for protectress, he designated the pious Veronica, in gratitude for her services rendered him on the road to Calvary. 
Just let that sink in for a second. He said to her that next to the sacraments, this was the greatest grace that he could give her, this work of reparation, adoring our Lord's face. Um, After giving her these revelations, he also favored her with this remark. Those who do not recognize this as my work, close their eyes and will not see. This is the point where at the beginning of the revelations, one day, I believe she was in front of the Eucharist, and she was crying out in agony to the Lord. And he said to her, My daughter, I have heard your sighs and your groans, and I have witnessed your ardent desire to glorify me. My name is everywhere blasphemy. There are even children who blaspheme me. Now, this is the year 1843. Look what's happening in our times. Is there anything that isn't blaspheming our Lord everywhere? Uh, then he made her see these frightful, this frightful sin, how it wounded his divine heart, and more grievously than any other sins, showing her how blasphemy and the sinners curse him face to face, and then he dictated the following prayer to her, the golden arrow. May the most holy, most sacred, most adorable, most incomprehensible, and unutterable name of God be always praised, blessed, loved, adored, glorified in heaven, on earth, and in the hells by all the creatures of God and by the sacred heart of our Lord Jesus Christ in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Amen. It's just a beautiful, beautiful prayer when you contemplate those words and pray it. It's a beautiful prayer. And after he dictated this, he then showed her the torrents of graces for the conversion of sinners streaming from his sacred heart, delightfully wounded by the golden arrow. Next, our Lord asked Sister Marie to to battle the enemies of God. And so he gave her various inspirations, but one of the inspirations that he gave her was the Holy Face Chaplet. And this is a Holy Face Chaplet. It looks very similar to a rosary. And uh, we'll get into the more of the explanation later of it. Um, but then later on, in, uh, in another revelation of a few years later, he said to her, uh, the society known as the communists had so far only one outbreak, but they were working secretly to advance their schemes. And oh, if you only knew how secret their diabolical plots and their anti-Christian principles To obtain mercy, ask, therefore, this work of reparation be established by your addressing yourself to him through the bound duty of his office can establish it. Now, our Lord was referring to the bishop at Tours. He wanted her to bring this work of reparation to the bishop. Later on, he also said to her, Well, my daughter, it is the communists who have dragged me from my tabernacles, profaned and despoiled my sanctuaries, and have even dared to raise their hands against the anointed of the Lord, but their designs shall be frustrated. And this is very interesting because the Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx wasn't written yet. So our Lord was revealing to her the name of the specific people that were attacking the church, the communists. And she didn't know, she wouldn't have had any idea who or what a communist was. Okay, so I said the Holy Face Chaplet. Um, it's made. It's comprised of 39, 39 beads. And uh, I was comp- contemplating this one time, and I said, "Well, why thirty nine beads?" And I looked it up, and I said, "It's traditionally the amount of lashes that the Romans gave was thirty nine or forty minus one, thirty nine, because they believed that the person would probably die." with more than that. Now, I'm not disputing how many lashes our Lord received because we know through Revelation that he might have received triple that. Um, So it's comprised of 39 beads, 33 small beads, 30 of which represent his uh, private life and three representing his public life. And then we have six glory beads um, or six large beads in which we say that my Jesus mercy and the glory be on. And the large beads represent each one of them 
represent um, a sense of our Lord, uh, his sense of touch, hearing, sight, smell, taste. And on the last glory be that we do, you do, we do the wounds on his sacred face and his last, his three public years. This is, this is so important because as Father mentioned, you know, restoring the dignity of humanity is our senses have been appalled through the ages, right? Uh, our senses are attacked by the, by the devil every day. And so, and our, our Lord, his, all of his senses were wounded to the extreme uh, during his passion. And so when we make reparation for those wounds and we, you know, we're actually asking the Lord to bring us, restore our senses to ourself. It's a plea to God to restore us in his image and likeness, our senses, back to our Lord Jesus. And we end, we usually end up the chaplet. It ends with, an, oh God, our protector, look down upon us and cast thine eyes upon the face of thy Christ. So the primary, the, the, the 33 beads, you say, we say, and arise, O Lord, let thy enemies be scattered. Let them that hate thee flee before thy face. And this is like a mini exorcism. St. Athanasius had said, he had asked the demons, what verse in the Bible do they fear the most? And the demons replied, it's that verse that begins with, Arise, O Lord, let thy enemies be scattered. Let them that hate thee flee before thy face. This comes from Psalm 67, if you're using the Dewey Ramos Bible or the old um, Latin Bible. In the newer Bibles, it's Psalm 68. But it also goes back to Numbers 10, uh, 35. Which, uh, in which Moses was holding up the Ark of the Covenant and he would pronounce these words before they would go on to fight the, uh, fight the enemy. So it's really, if you think about it in modern terms, uh, we're really, we're lifting up the church, uh, we're lifting up the new Ark of the Covenant, Our Lady, and we're fighting a battle head on against the enemies of Christ. Well, now we get to the good part, and I'm going to turn this over to my wife. She's going to read the promises of our Lord. Sure. So the first promise was given way back in the 13th century to St. Gertrude the Great, and she had a deep devotion to the Holy Face. And one day she was praying and making reparation to the Holy Face, and she asked the Lord that special graces be, plant, be um, given, be gifted to those who honor his Holy Face. And this is what he said to her in reply. They shall receive in themselves by the impression of my humanity, a bright irradiation of my divinity, and shall be so illuminated by it in their inmost souls that by their likeness to my face, they shall shine with a brightness surpassing that of many others in eternal life. Uh, next, St. Mictilde, she also, when praying, she asked our Lord that those who celebrate the memory of his sweet face should never be deprived of his amiable company. And he replied, not one of them shall be separated from me. Now the next seven uh, promises of our Lord Jesus were all given to Sister Marie de St. Pierre in the 1840s. So, promise number three, our Lord said to Sister Marie de St. Pierre that he has promised me that he will imprint his divine likeness on the souls of those who honor his most holy countenance. And he said his words, this adorable face is, as it were, is the seal of the divinity, which has the virtue of reproducing the likeness of God in the souls that are applied to it. And this particular re revelation she received upon adoring our Lord's adorable face in the Eucharist. Number four, by my holy face, you shall work miracles. Boy, we sure need those today. And uh, those were surely witnessed through the devotion of Venerable Leo de Pont. Number five, by my holy face, you will obtain the conversion of many sinners. Nothing that you ask in making this offering will be refused to you. If you knew how pleasing the sight of my face is to my Father. 
And now we all have family members and friends who have strayed away from the faith. And so through this devotion, we can be assured of conversions and having those loved ones come back into the family of God. Number six, as in a kingdom, you can procure all you wish for with a coin marked with the prince's effigy. So in the kingdom of heaven, you will obtain all you desire with the precious coin of my holy humanity, which is my adorable countenance. Now this particular promise was said to give Sister Marie de Saint Pierre so much joy and so much confidence because she realized the magnificence and the nobility of the gift that our Lord Jesus had given to her of the holy face. All those who honor my holy face in a spirit of reparation will by doing so perform the office of the pious Veronica. How beautiful to meditate on that notion of the sixth station of the cross, like Ted spoke about earlier, about this woman who broke through the mob to wipe our Lord's face of all the dust, blood, sweat, and spittle. And uh, just, just to be unafraid just to have that courageous compassion and that we too can enter into that and provide our Lord with much consolation by spiritually wiping his face. Number eight, according to the care you take in making reparation to my face, disfigured by blasphemies, so will I take care of yours, which has been disfigured by sin. I will reprint therein my image and render it as beautiful as it was on leaving the baptismal fount. So I was contemplating this last night, reading it over, and I thought, wow, okay, I'm going to be 58 this year, and this sounds like a a spiritual facelift. I'm in. (laughs) Bring it on, Lord. (laughs) Number nine, our Lord has promised me, sit again, Sister St. Pierre, for all those who defend his cause in this work of reparation by words, by prayers, or in writings, that he will defend them before his Father at their death. He will purify their souls by effacing all the blots of sin and will restore to them their primitive beauty. So there we have it. Not only promises for us in this this earthly exile, but also glorious promises for us in eternal life. So let's, um, let's look at the saints and the doctors of the church. What have they got to say about the holy face devotion? And we go back to St. Gertrude. Tell me, O Lord, she exclaimed, the remedy that can soothe the sufferings of, the di- of thy divine face. And Jesus replied to her, if anyone meditates on my sufferings with tenderness and compassion, his heart will be moved to me as a soothing balm to these wounds. St. Mechtild, conversing with her sisters, said, Let us, full of desire, hasten to venerate the sweetest countenance of our Lord, which will in heaven be our all. So this prepares us for the beatific vision, right? St. Augustine, um, his works were so proliferous, and um, he mentioned the holy face so many times in his writing that uh, Father Stefano Padecca, who who did a, a study on this, he said it would merit a separate study on its own. And because of the length of those quotes, I didn't even put one in here because it would take a whole slide by itself. Um, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, the face is the interpreter of of the soul. That's what he said. And he composed the hymn, O Sacred Head Surrounded. And we're all familiar with that too. And there was also a hymn during our Holy Mass today that was also attributed to St. Bernard of Clairvaux. It's the first time we had heard of it. Yeah, we didn't know. St. Jude, the apostle, carried with him an image of Christ so as not to be mistaken as the betrayer. Everywhere he went, he had that image because he didn't want to be referred to as the betrayer of of the other (laughs) Judas. St. John Christendom stirred up the faithful to gaze at the face of Christ, insulted, derided, and slapped, and to see in this glory of God that this for us humiliated and hidden. Many popes wrote beautiful prayers, hymns, canticles, 
uh, some of which are, in, are printed in the Arch Confraternity Manual of the Holy Face. Um, these are but a few of a much larger list. Um, there's a whole book of this that it, it just blew my mind whenever I went through this and read all the different scenes and stuff like that. So what did our popes have to say? Uh, Blessed Pius IX, when referring to the work of reparation, because he was at the time, he was the Pope when Sister Marie de, uh, de St. Pierre started having these um, revelations. And, and he was the one that also called for the veneration of the image, which led to the mir miracle 175 years ago today. Right. So he said that this reparation is a work destined to save society. St. Pius X desired that the holy face of Jesus be venerated in all Christian families. Venerable Pius XII established the Feast of the Holy Face on Shrove Tuesday. How many of you know that? Not many, right? <laughs> uh, so this is something that really needs to be brought back. And, and there's a special novena leading up to the Shrove Tuesday for the Holy Face, and it's just incredible. The, uh, the spiritual enlightenment that I received just reading through these, this novena was incredible. It blew my mind. St. John Paul II. To contemplate the face of Christ and to contemplate it with Mary is the program which I have set before the church at the dawn of the third millennium. And I'm sorry if that was really bad, but I couldn't resist. Uh, I mean, his, John Paul II's encyclicals and his writings are so full of the holy face, it's mind-blowing, especially when he talks about his um, encyclical on the rosary uh, and his encyclical on the, new, the, the, the third millennium. Um, Pope Benedict XVI said, the desire to know God, to see the face of God is inherent in every human being, even atheists. Seeking the face of Jesus must be the longing of all Christians. We persevere in our quest for the face of the Lord. At the end of our earthly pilgrimage, he, Jesus, will be our eternal, our reward and glory forever. Now we get to our favorite saint, right? <laughs> saint Therese of the Child Jesus. When she entered the Carmelite, her sister Pauline was already in already ahead of her. She was already there. And she had asked uh, the mother abbess, um, can I give a book of the life of Sister Marie de St. Pierre to St. Therese? She asked permission. And she said, yes, yes, I think she'll, she'll, she'll be ready. When she handed her the book, she said to her, you have a lot in common with this saint. Where the, she called her a saint, a saint, but she wasn't, of course, she's not a saint. She hasn't been reclaimed a saint. But she said, you have a lot in common with, with her. They both had a special devotion to the Holy, Holy Child Jesus. Um, Sister Marie de St. Pierre uh, wanted to be the Lord's little donkey. That's what she wanted to be. She wanted to serve the Holy Family as a donkey, doing all the manual labor. And that's how she devoted her life. She said every little bit of manual labor that she did in her life, she devoted as being the donkey of our Lord. St. Therese of Lisieux, she wanted to be a toy, right? A ball. She wanted to be a ball. And a toy box. And for, our Lord for, Jesus' for our toy Lord, box. You know, so that's... To bounce around and <laughs> <laughs> just have, a, have a ball with. <laughs> so anyway, when she, she read the book um, and she embraced this devotion and took it really seriously in her heart, she carried a locket of hair from Sister, Sister Marie de St. Pierre and she kept a small picture of her. Uh, so they also had in common a devotion to the precious blood yes. of Jesus. Yes. Thank you. So she, um, St. Therese of Lisieux, uh, composed several canticles and prayers to the Holy Face. And uh, this was one of the quotes. Uh, oh, I would I wish to tell the, everybody to study and venerate the image of the Holy Face as he left it on the Veronica's veil. When sorrow strikes, it will be the only consolation. No matter what our grief, surely it will never be as fearful as was his. 
Look at his adorable face, his glazed and sunken eyes, his wounded, his wounds. Look Jesus in the face. There you will see how he loves you. Your veiled gaze is our heaven. And this was a quote from her sister Genevieve. Um, the devotion to the holy face was for Therese the crown and complement of her love for the sacred humanity of our Lord. The blessed face was the mirror wherein she beheld the heart and soul of her, beloved, her well-beloved. And just as a picture of a loved one serves to bring the whole person before us, so in the holy face of Christ, Therese beheld the entire humanity of Jesus. We can say unequivocally that this devotion was the burning inspiration of the saint's life. Her devotion to the holy face transcended, or more accurately, embraced all the other attractions of her spiritual life. Wow. St. Therese and all her sisters and her father were all registered members with the Arch Confraternity of the Holy Face. In fact, one of the first. Same. One of the first, yeah, yeah in fact, yeah. So. On to modern times. On to modern times. Do you, everybody remember hearing about this in the news a few months ago? Sister Wilhelmina? Um, well, she was the uh, Benedictine Sisters, Mary, Mary Queen of the Apostles. Uh, at the age of 70. Um, four years after her death in 2023, the sisters were preparing for the reinterment of her remains and of their beloved founders. And um, they noticed that they discovered something incredible. They peered through the, ca the casket and they found that she looks incorrupt. So when they opened the casket, they found that her body was incorrupt. And of course, this is still under investigation, so, um, but we know that she was a registered member of the Confraternity of the Holy Face in Dallas, Texas. We know that because Father Carney, who I said was a, um, an expert on the Holy Face, was her spiritual director and her confessor. And he reaffirmed with, he called up the Confraternity, said, is she registered? Yes, she's absolutely registered. So this... This goes without saying that, you know, our Lord told us that by his holy face, he will work miracles. And I believe that he's trying to tell us in modern times, we need to know what this devotion can do. So he's, this, I believe this is a great revelation. So let's get to what are the requirements of the holy face devotion. Uh, when you register with the Archcon Fraternity, this is what it takes. You got two minutes a day? Everybody had two minutes a day? That's all it takes and one hour a month for a meeting. Um, that's a little tricky. So what members do, you enroll in the Archcon Fraternity you re and you receive a packet from them. You recite every day for the Archcon Fraternity members, uh, one Our Father, one Hail Mary, and one Glory Be, and a, O Lord, show us thy face and we shall be saved. And I would also encourage people to say the golden arrow every day. If you want to really, really want to wipe our Lord's face and comfort his divine heart, I would highly recommend that. Members take on, they should wear an effigy of the holy face, either a cross or a medal or a scapular. And um, when you sign up with them, you get this beautiful white scapular with the holy face on it. Um, and you get a little cross and a little medal. Um, avoid blasphemy in the profanation of Sundays and you repair those evils by interior acts of reparation by saying the prayers, um, the litany especially, and the um, chaplet. So if you hear somebody in public or somebody that you know that um, takes our Lord's name in vain, you can either say interiorly or just very quietly, blessed be the name of Jesus in reparation. Sit nominum domine benedictum. So um, you attend as often as possible the monthly meeting. Well, that becomes tricky because we need more people to run the devotions on Tuesday nights or whatever night you pick or, or Sunday afternoon or whatever. If you have a regular meeting for these prayers, you have a leader who can then lead with extra prayers and that takes care of your monthly meetings. You don't have to travel to Tours, France 
can you can do it in a local in a local parish um, getting your parish obviously getting your priest's permission to do it first um, so then and you, we also also one of the other um, members you you uh, you want to extend and promote as much as can the devotion to the holy face passing out leaflets just talking to people about it um, sending them there's so many videos on the internet of the Holy Face devotion, so many beautiful ones. Uh, if you visit our website, you'll see a ton of them that you can watch. So that's it. I mean, it's not a huge requirement to do this devotion. Uh, but uh, what we found, when you start doing the devotion, you fall in love with this devotion because when you're, when you're looking at the face of our Lord and you're saying these prayers, healing begins uh, within yourself. From my personal testimony, a healing begins in yourself. So in conclusion, um, our Lord revealed something to Sister Mary that we really got to take seriously. He said, I saw God's justice was preparing to send still more chastisements. And our Lord communicated to me at this time, he would use the instruments of punishment, not the elements, not nature, but the malice of revolutionary men. And he was specifically referring to communism and modernism, which and every other ism that transcends out of those, um, out of communism. And we can see plainly by the messages um, that these were a precursor to La Salette, Fatima, Akita, Garen Bendel, etc. Now it's up to us to respond. This devotion, like I mentioned earlier, it's, it's, it's been suppressed. Just like the rosary, just like the Sacred Heart devotion, the devil promised that he would try everything in his, in his duty to try and suppress this devotion. And to a certain extent, he was successful. This devotion was extremely popular up until World War I. And in fact, this was devotion worldwide. It was even practiced in Quebec, um, in the States, um, all over the place. So what can we do, Joe? <laughs> well, the question, what can we do? What can I do? When everywhere we look around us, all we see is a great big mess. And how can I, one person, fix it? They're all undeniably good questions. We live in a post-Christian society, thanks in part to what Ted mentioned, the rise of the isms. So communism, as Ted said, materialism, relativism, consumerism, modernism, sensationalism, and more currently, wokeism, critical racism, and here's one that's very prevalent, a lack of common sensism. <laughs> we are here to tell you that there is something concrete that you can do. With God, there's always hope. So God indeed has given us a remedy in the Holy Face devotion. Going back to the Old Testament in Leviticus 26, our Lord recounts that those who keep his commands especially those concerning the proper respect due to him, will enjoy many blessings. So if we take our Lord's words and we unite them to the Holy Face devotion, if there are five of us praying, we can pursue a hundred of our enemies. If there are a hundred of us praying, we can pursue 10,000. How is this possible? Because the Lord will fight for us. He will destroy evil in the hearts of mankind. Putting this in the light of the New Testament, the objective becomes conversion. In fact, Christ told Sister Marie de Saint Pierre that the arms of his enemies inflict death, but his arms restore life. And he said to her again at another time, I do not desire the death of the sinner, but I want him to be converted and to live. 
So the holy face devotion described by Jesus himself as the most beautiful work under the sun is the sure way out of our current predicament. Offering the wounded face of Christ to the Father to repair or make reparation for all of the irreverence against the Holy Trinity and the profanation against the Holy Days of Obligation and Sundays in particular will release man from the grip of his enemies. So we need you, dear friends, to join in the fight to save society and restore Christendom. God promised to Sister Marie de St. Pierre that this devotion will defeat communism, which is really the root, as Ted said, of all the other isms, and bring salvation to the masses. The arch confraternity of the holy face is the supernatural armament heaven has given mankind to defeat revolutionary men. And in addition, the Holy Rosary is the gift given to us by our Blessed Mother for conversions and to restore peace to our ailing world. These devotions work hand in hand. They're like a one-two punch of spiritual warfare. And so our Lord Jesus told little Sister Marie that he would be the commander-in-chief of the Holy Face Army in defending the glory of his Father but we also need to beg our Blessed Mother for the grace for her to be our 12-star general, just like what she said to St. Catherine Labore, that so many souls don't come to her and ask for graces. Well, now's the time to ask her to be our 12-star general. And if I could just add one more thing, this devotion when you pray it is very powerful, but um, to borrow a catchphrase from our uh, our our lovely friends at the Marian Devotional Movement, and if I hope I get this analogy correct, praying alone is like a drip in a faucet. Praying in a group is like turning on that faucet. But when you pray in an arch confraternity, you are united in the church, and you're praying like Niagara Falls. That's the power of this devotion, when you pray it as, a, as in union with, your, with the church. So we are proposing to you three battalions of spiritual union and reparation to smite the evils of blasphemy and the profanation of Sundays and holy days of obligation in our times under the principal patronage of St. Joseph, Terror of Demons, patron of Canada. So the first level are the defenders who with the help of our Blessed Mother pray the two minute reparation prayers that Ted outlined earlier and B attend a monthly meeting to pray the Holy Face devotional prayers in order to defend the holy name of God. The second level are the archers, or the defenders plus, who through their fervent intercessory prayers mystically send a golden arrow into the bosom of our Heavenly Father and into the Sacred Heart of Jesus by the aid of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And finally are the captains, or the defenders plus plus, who would nobly lead valiant armies in their own parishes in a monthly Holy Face devotion meeting with the blessing of their pastors. These captains would fight with the arms of the Lord's cross as the standard and the bullet by bullet ammunition of each bead of Our Lady's Holy Rosary to advance the Holy Face devotion. These three levels of battalions of reparation or spiritual union are available to help fulfill our Lord's promise to dear Sister Marie, that the more the army of God is augmented, the more the army of Satan will be weakened. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, living out the holy face devotion on your own or as part of the St. Joseph's missionaries is completely what you can do to reclaim the church in time for Christ. If you are interested in becoming a part of um, these three levels of spiritual union, there will be sign-up sheets in the atrium and after our short question and answer period, as well as resources, prayer cards, and Holy Face chaplets available. As an added incentive, we will be gifting those who sign up today with the St. Joseph's Missionaries a third-class relic image of the Holy Face, which Ted will give you a few more details about now. <laughs> It becomes really confusing. Um, we have a friend in um, Australia who sent, who's 
mother has an original linen. So he made some prints, uh, quite a few prints for us. He took them and he went to his mother's house and he touched each one of them to the original veil. And that original veil was of course touched to the original veil of Veronica. Um, so then he then also has a relic of Fulton Sheen, which he also touched it to, and we also touched each of those images to St. Therese of Lisieux. A first relic, class relic. A relic of hers as well. Mm -hmm. So these, uh, limbs, these images have been well, well blessed. Holy fine. <laughs> Holy fine. <laughs> so anyway, um, these are the resources and books that uh, we recommend reading. Um, we have a few of them downstairs, not all of them, some of them, but most of them you can get online, and a lot of these are listed on our website, so if you go to our website, you can find them for, for downloading. So, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> I have a question over there, way at the back. So a monthly meeting is basically more prayers. So a leader would just lead the, uh, the group in more prayers. Usually we like to say the litany, the chaplet. Um, if you could do a rosary, that's great. Uh, you could do a reading from the, from the um, Arch Confraternity Manual. Um, you can do a reading out of here, just a, a reflection, and add together with the litany. Make up approximately an hour. It doesn't even have to be an hour, depending on how long your mass is and if you have adoration and everything else. Um, just just so that you meet face to face once a month. So, um, well, you decide that with you, you. You decide that with your parish priest. Yes, we do. We we're out in Corkery. Um, I don't know if St. Michael's in Corkery. We do it on Tuesday nights. But we need other churches to do it. We need leaders everywhere else, and uh, we're prepared to help other leaders to get started uh, with ma materials and stuff like that. Now, Ted and I are both introverts, so that if we can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, yes, she was asking about the Shroud of Turin. Um, I'm glad you asked that question. The Holy Face Devotion Work of Reparation is, is all centered around the Veil of Veronica. We know there is another mystic that had revelations that were surrounded around the shroud, the, uh, the Turin, and they also they hand out little medals, which are good for evangelization. Our Lord gives us images for different purposes in different times. Uh, the Veil of Veronica is, is strictly for a deeper devotion for, for Catholics. And particularly in regards to the Lord's Passion, and I'm sure we could all agree that our church is going through a passion right now. Yeah. So. There is a lot more reasons for using the veil of devotion for, for this particular, for these prayers, because that's what our Lord asked for. And it's also what the church has canonically established. So if you're going to say the prayers, we recommend, and I know there are several groups out there who pray the prayers and they use the Shroud of Turin. Is it wrong? I don't think it's wrong, but it's the benefits of what you're getting. You're, if, you're, if you're in line with the church and if you're doing what the church has already approved, you can't go wrong, right? So I'm, I'm not saying it's... it's I, I'm, I'm looking forward to a time where somebody in our ecclesiastical authority addresses this as an issue and says, it's a complementary image of our Lord, which, and I, I love the Lord. I love our Shroud of Turin. It's, it's a beautiful image and we have one hanging in our house. But when we say the prayers, we use the veil of Veronica because we want to follow the church, uh, which has been kind of canonically established. So, so definitely the, the Shroud of Turin addresses our Lord's death. But if you were to take both images and put one on top of the other, you would see very similar facial features in the nose and the lips, the shape of the face itself. So they're very complementary. I'm sure that you could, you know, if you met if you met once a month in your home and did the prayers, I'm sure that would be. Fine. I mean, I, I would seek um, I would seek a pastoral advice on that, but I'm sure it would be fine. Yeah. Any other questions? So with that, I just want to thank everybody here. I want to thank um, Deacon Ron Bishop, and I want to thank um, Father, Father Lawrence. Lawrence for inviting us in for 
allowing you this opportunity to, to spread this devotion. And I seriously hope that people would take this to heart. And if you have any more questions, you can always reach us through our website. Yeah, so special thanks to uh, Lara and John Pacheco. Yeah. Another thing that we're involved in with St. Joseph's Mission is we're about to launch um, the Holy Face Armada. And what that is, is we want to reach out to all the leaders of the groups throughout the world for this Holy Face devotion and get them together talking and collaborating uh, to set up Holy Face conferences online or resource materials and stuff like that. So this is in the works. So it's going to be an international effort. And so far we have uh, groups come forward from Australia in the States and another group in Canada that have already joined forces in this fleet. So we're very excited about it. So we thank you all for coming and, and, and spending the, this time with us and listening to us. Even the, the Father, Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Spirit amen. amen. Glory, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen.